Gun owners across Canada are united in their opposition to the recent move by the federal government to issue a ban on many types of rifles in Canada. Was it justified or is it all about politics? Today's guest is Alan Friesen, president of the Lethbridge Fish and Game Association. Welcome, Alan, to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So, Alan, the federal government has issued an order in council motion to ban 1,500 types of rifles in Canada. While there are many who think this will reduce gun violence, there are many who disagree. What's the feedback that you're hearing from members of the Lethbridge Fish and Game Association? Very discouraging, very, um, just cannot believe how this makes any sense. This is like a, a crazy craziness. It's not going to help at all. And it's going to cost us as Canadian taxpayers huge, huge dollars. So it, it's just the biggest waste of money that we could possibly do at a time when we can really use that money to make investments that are going to help us through our current crisis, right? What's happening now, so... Mm -hmm. Interesting point. So obviously the hope, I guess, is that this gun ban will reduce gun violence. Now I'm sure it will stop legal gun owners, you know, farmers, ranchers, hunters, sports shooters from owning the kinds of guns that they have safely owned for decades. But how would a criminal, say a gang member, view this gun ban? Would it stop them from getting a gun? Yeah, not in any way. Like, I mean, all this is doing is further compounding the rules and the legitimate firearm owners like myself have no problem complying with the rules and purchasing equipment that we could legally purchase in the past to change the rules now and say, oh, you bought that legally, you've owned it for 20 years, but now we're going to take it away from you because obviously you can't be responsible with it. 20 years I've had it and nothing, everything was proper. So where's the problem? This is... I. This might be a little bit too long an answer, but one thing I wanted to mention to you, I've been teaching the firearm safety course, one of the requirements to get a license in Canada for decades. And during that period of time, I've had thousands of students. Never once did I have a student that I said, oh man, this, this person should not own a firearm. Never happened once. Now, how is that possible out of thousands of people? I never saw one person that I would say shouldn't own a firearm because all of the criminal people, they're not gonna show up. They're not gonna take the course. They're not gonna fill out all the paperwork. They're gonna go steal a gun from somebody, right? So it's, it's crazy. Like I'm big fan of putting the penalties on the criminals and making them severe because myself and my, my peers who are the responsible firearm owners and the legal firearm owners have no problems with gun violence being very strictly uh, uh, controlled and severe penalties. No problems there. So Yeah, absolutely. Now, the Prime Minister is calling these rifles military-grade assault weapons that are designed to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Can you sort of unpack that? How much accuracy is there in that statement? Yeah, there's like zero. The, the reality is every firearm can be lethal right every every firearm could be used as a weapon well as could baseball bats as could cars as could golf clubs be used as weapons the firearms that i have are not weapons the firearms that my peers have are not weapons they're recreational equipment right so now are there different rates of fire and those kind of things and different types of calibers and easier to use type of equipment more ergonomically designed of course there's all kinds of differences if you're a sporting person if you're competing you want to have the best equipment that you can use safely, accurately, and fast is what you're trying to do, right? So it's a, it, all of the, basically somebody's looked at a picture in a picture and said, oh, this one must be prohibited. Look how scary it looks, right? That's in essence what has happened. The ones that are being banned, there's other ones that are exactly the same in their form and function. They use the same caliber ammunition, the same semi-automatic type of uh, uh, action, uh, and they are not prohibited. So it's like, oh, this one looks scary. Let's prohibit that one. So the whole military grade, blah, 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 it just doesn't make any sense. There's firearms that are firearms. I, as a Canadian citizen, a civilian, never have access to military equipment anyways. Military equipment, way different deal. I, I don't know if you know the distinction between a fully automatic and a semi-automatic. Military police SWAT teams, they use fully automatic firearms. Fully automatic firearms, you press the trigger and it just shoots until the magazine empties. So no Canadian civilian has access to that equipment and has not for 
I think it was in 1986, I believe, that they became prohibited. Um, so that uh, decades, decades, decades that that's been, a, that's been a, the reality. So mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm so glad we're talking to you about this. Okay, so the Prime Minister says that there will be a buyback program, so the government will purchase these guns from the owners and then destroy them. The cost will be massive, and Premier Kenny is suggesting that this money would be better spent targeting gangs and gun smugglers. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Premier Kenny is right on the money. The people that use this equipment as weapons inappropriately, they should be severely punished, no question. And and crimes, uh, pardon me, the the uh, the uh, gang, there's the word, I couldn't think, think of the word gang. Gang crime is certainly something where those efforts should be put towards stopping that use and controlling that. I mean, the other part too, that would be a great investment is in mental health type issues. We had that recent, the gentleman in Nova Scotia, well, not gentleman, that's maybe not the right word, but he kills a whole bunch of people and kills himself. Super, super sad that that happens. And how do, how do we control that? That's a mental health problem. That's not, if you took a van and plowed through a bunch of people, nobody would say, let's, let's, uh, let's prohibit vans. But it's a mental health problem that needs to be addressed. So. Premier Kenny is also considering getting our own chief firearms officer here in Alberta. So how does that work? Would this have some benefits for Alberta's gun owners? I don't know. It's an interesting idea. Uh, I don't really know much more of the details about it, but it is a federal law. So having a provincial, what does that mean? We're going to pull out of the of the Canadian gun laws and have the Alberta gun laws? I'm not sure if that's you know productive. I mean, right now we've got a country that has a consistent law, and the consistent the laws that are in place right now are very sufficient. Very our process in terms of approving a new firearm owner in Canada is on par or better than any other country that exists. I know we always get compared to, to uh, the United States, but we're way, way different than the United States in terms of our process for getting people, vetting people so that they can have a firearm in their possession. Interesting. Okay, so part of the debate is uh, on this gun ban is that, uh, that it didn't go through a democratic parliamentary process, which would have allowed for debate and for experts to have some input into this. Could that have been helpful? Oh, very much so. I mean, right now, uh, it's people with a political agenda who are saying, we're going to do this to get votes, to get reelected is really what they're doing. It's, it has no bearing on public safety at all. It's a huge, huge uh, cost burden, tax burden it's going to be. It's going to be massive. Like, I don't know how many billions, but it'll be 40, 50 billion. Uh, it'll be crazy. And there's going to be, unfortunately, there's going to be people who are legal firearm owners today who think it's unfair. I'm not one of them, but think it's unfair and will not abide by that law because they think that law is unfair. Then they become a criminal. So instead of reducing criminal activity, we're going to increase criminal activity, right? Not, not that they're going to use the firearms inappropriately, but they're just saying, I spent $5,000 for this piece of equipment. I am not going to accept $500 when I legally bought it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So Right. And it's a fair argument, right? It's interesting, exactly. yeah, it's interesting to see that the government didn't issue a ban on handguns, which are more widely used than rifles when it comes to gun violence. Any thoughts on why they didn't do that? Oh, that's the next phase, right? I mean, basically what they're trying to do is as much as possible divide the firearm owning community and say, oh, okay, well, there's not many people here, so we'll take their stuff. And then when that's pop, you know, then that part is, the furrer has died down. Oh, then we're going to take these. The furrer. I like that. Furrer. <laughs> I don't know why I use that word. But anyways, <laughs> furrer and no, no. Uh, so anyways, that's uh, um, once that dies down, then it'll be the next ones and then it'll be the next ones. And also the gun legislation, if you look at it closely, what they're proposing right now, also would prohibit 12 gauge shotguns, 12 gauge shotguns. Every farm in the country has a 12 gauge shotgun. And then the, the RCMP say, oh, well, yeah, don't worry about that. We wouldn't use that. Even though it's in the legislation, we wouldn't use it. Okay, so if we do get to that next stage where they do put a ban on handguns, would a handgun ban do anything to reduce gun violence in your opinion? No, there's, again, there's, I'm a, I'm a handgun owner. I have several handguns, right? And they're different 
pieces of equipment for different sports that and I bought them legally and I got a permit to transfer them to my house. I have a permit to take them to the shooting range. That's how regu uh, regulated they are. Anybody who's not doing that as a criminal would be, as a gang member would be, that they're stealing guns and then using them for to to rob people or or those kind of things. They aren't following those rules anyway. So again, it's going to compound or take away property from uh, responsible Canadian law-abiding citizens, and, in, and and the criminals are still going to have the guns, right? That's it's, it's not going to save anything that way. The severe penalties on the criminals are really where that money needs to be spent to make a difference in public safety. Yeah, and we often hear people say that it's too easy for someone to get a gun license in Canada, that our gun laws are too lax. How accurate is that? Can anyone get a license or is there a strict process already in place? So let's say you decided you were going to be a firearm owner, right? You would one, take a course and then, or take two courses perhaps. One, there's a course for the non-restricted firearms, which are rifle shotguns of normal length. And then there's another one for restricted firearms, which are rifle shotguns that are shorter in their overall length, shorter in their barrel length, and handguns that are of normal length. Those are in the restricted thing. So let's say you were going to be a target shooter. You you take the, the non-restricted course. You take the restricted course. You'd apply for a possession and acquisition license. When you apply for the possession and acquisition license, you're going to provide references. You're going to ask, you're going to answer questions about your mental stability, your marital relationships. Then when you apply, they're going to check your references. They're going to get you a, a, a license if you if you meet the qualifications. And then after you have that, if you're going to go, let's say, to the shooting range to use it, their shooting sports facility, they often have another course. Like we have a course here in Lethbridge. It's called the range officer course. So, okay, if you're coming here, these are the rules, right? And, and from teaching that firearm safety course, the way that people are taught, every firearm they pick up, the two main things in terms of practical handling is they keep their finger off the trigger and they keep the safest muzzle direction never ever pointed at a person, even if they know the gun is unloaded, right? So it's really straightforward. And then, then there's the registration process on the restricted firearms. And then there's the authorization to transport that you have to be a member of a gun club in good standing. And then you also have that you can transport to that that uh, range only. You can't just like leave it in your car like they would do in the United States. It's like it's in three locks, trigger lock, lock case, unloaded, of course, unloaded, trigger lock, lock case, lock trunk of your car. So three locks when you transport it down to the shooting range. Right. So it's very strictly regulated and reasonably like I, I, I don't. I don't have any problem with that. I would be concerned if it was like the States and I had a loaded gun in my council or something like that's how they do it in uh, there. And we don't do it that way. It's very strictly regulated. Oh, wow. It sounds like it. Lots of education to go into it too. Now you'd mentioned mental health issues earlier. So many of these mass shootings seem to be committed by individuals with some kind of a mental health issue. Do we need stricter ways of vetting gun owners for mental health? Well, that is a good question, because when they do the vetting initially, they you don't every five years you have to reapply. Right. So you have to reapply five years and you answer the same questions about your mental health and stability and all those kind of things. Now, in the intervening five years, can something go wrong and, you know, somebody falls off the rails. Right. That that can happen. They develop some sort of mental illness or, that can occur. Now, one thing that does happen as a firearm owner, I know that the police check me every day. As a firearm owner, I'm at a higher standard of care. So every day the police check me to see if I've had any criminal activity because I'm a firearm owner or any reported, anything like that is what they do for all firearm owners across Canada. So they are trying to monitor it that way, but somebody like the person in Nova Scotia did not have any license, did not like acquired a firearm illegally, used it illegally, obviously, and used it as a weapon. So th they do those things all the time, those checks. So what other things can, you know, what other precautions could be made? I'm not too sure. So yeah, mental health though, is definitely where those dollars right now, we, our country is having an epidemic of mental health concerns, right? And like that, my day job is involved with getting people resources to help them with that. And and it's those are services that are used extensively because they need to be. People are people are challenged right now, of course, right? So yeah, absolutely.
Uh, thank you so much, Ellen, for being on our show. It's been very, very enlightening and interesting to have you on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. That is Alan Friesen, president of the Lethbridge Fish and Game Association.